Please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First this evening, we have public hearings. RSA 41, semicolon 14, a first hearing for Second Street release deed restriction number four, single family, four bedroom, and subdivision restrictions. Mr. Council. Yeah. Yes, this uh, comes back again. The uh, attorney, sorry, was here last time. Uh, this, is, this is premises uh, at 4 2nd Street that uh, when it was leased uh, consisted of a uh, 50 by 100 foot lot uh, which had on it four different structures. Um, it was, uh, it had these deed restrictions at, saying there would be only one single family dwelling, no more than four bedrooms, and uh, that there would not be a subdivision. Uh, even though the lease itself did not contain a subdivision restriction. So um, we in often encounter that these d uh, deed restrictions are put on property that already uh, would be in violation of it. Mm -hmm. So that uh, when it comes time years from then for there to be a sale or other activity, uh, the financing banks or buyers uh, have trouble with these restrictions. And this is one of them. Uh, in particular, the planning board uh, back in the early 90s uh, actually subdivided yeah. the, uh, yeah. the property um, and reduced, it reduced the number of buildings for, on the, what was the original lot from mm -hmm. four to three. And now uh, what one of the half of the lots is proposing to do is to tear down two cabins that are on it and to construct uh, one structure Good. that actually will eliminate non-conformities with setbacks, uh, but still has on paper uh, the problem of the yeah. no subdivision. Yeah. And so uh, there will still be, when they end up with it, two single family dwellings, as well as a, uh, a subdivision. Yeah. And uh, it, it will have, as I understand it, uh, five bedrooms. Okay. So, um, in any event, that's the background to that. And actually, the relief from the, from the restriction will not only assist the lot where they want to build the one structure, it will help the lot in front of that, which, yes. which also uh, was subdivided. Councilor, how many hearings do we need on this? Is this the only this is, one? No, by statute, we have to have a first hearing followed by a second spaced seven to ten, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, no, no less than seven days after right. that, and then a th yet another uh, matter, a date on which there will be an actual vote. So this is the first? This is the first of okay. two. Okay, so is there anyone out in the public that would like to speak? Seeing none, we'll move it back to the board. Mrs. Wolseley, questions? No, there's no one uh, responding. No, I'll wait for the next hearing. I have nothing right now. Jim? Yeah, the uh, Conservation Commission said no problem, right, in their letter? That's correct. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. they did a follow-up after we sent it back right. for the no right. subdivision as well. Right. And then the Planning Board had a question on parking. Correct. Which I think we have to be extremely careful about because what kind of problems do we run into all the time? Parking. Right. Yep. This is the street that we already have a parking problem. So we got to we got to really make sure that that's something that's taken care of in this. And uh, just uh, the the diagram of what is desired to happen is uh, a, has a garage built into the house with mm -hmm. two spaces inside. Okay. It's yeah. not it's uh, it's in a neighborhood with problems. Oh yes, but on this particular lot, uh, that will be uh, eliminated with the garage inside. Okay. So they're only going to have two spaces? Correct. For two places? Actually, one. It will. Two buildings are being torn down and re being replaced by one. One single family? One single family. Will there be any other uh, off street parking besides the garage? Uh, not to my knowledge. Not uh. from the application, anyway. I think, and I asked the planner uh, what was the nature of their problem with parking, and he 
he said it was generalized to the neighborhood itself rather than the particular lot. Mm -hmm. Didn't he also say it was because of five bedrooms? That they thought there might be more? That's correct. Yeah. That's why I'm thinking they should also spell out some parking outside, you know, not just in the garage, but just so that we don't have any problems in that neighborhood. Yeah. Any more problems. Yeah, yeah, there's already problems existing in that neighborhood. Right. <laughs> Actually, this, because it's not a subdivision or condominiumization, it would not be coming up in front of the planning board again. Mm -hmm. Right. Councilor, I believe I spoke with the uh, owner at our last meeting, and he said that the garage would accommodate two vehicles, and they would be able to park two vehicles in their driveway. That's that's what I recall him saying. So that becomes stacked parking. But it's not. Right. But it's not on the street. But that's stacked parking, so therefore somebody has to move for somebody else. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying, we've had right. problems. We better make sure that we're on top of this. Yep. Right. The stack would count uh, as only two spaces. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's what's that required for that. Uh, for a single dwelling unit, only requires two spaces. Yep. yep. Does that include the garage? Yes. If they if they stack the vehicles behind the garage, as the, as uh, right behind it as. Uh, uh, so like when Waddell mentioned, that would count as still only two spaces total for zoning purposes. Why would you park anything behind the garage? I'm sorry, leading into the garage. Oh, okay. Thank you. I believe that's, Jim, that was what yes, we were talking yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. So we're not doing any action right now. This is no. the first public hearing. This right. Is first. Right. Be another one. And then, and okay. then, for instance, if the applicant saw this, perhaps at the next hearing, that could address the mm -hmm. questions too. Yeah, I would just like to say that if anyone has any concerns, they should come to the next public hearing, or they should email the board of selectmen yeah. and let them know the concerns. The entire board of selectmen, please email. Thank yeah, you. Exactly. So our second. Um, Public hearing is RSA 41 semicolon 14 dash A first hearing for 907 Ocean Boulevard release deed restriction number four single family four bedroom and seven foot setback restrictions. Anyone from the public wishing to speak? Oh, good. My name is Bill Dufresne. I'm the owner of 907 Ocean Boulevard. It's also my year-round residency. I purchased the property in 2004 from my aunt. Uh, my aunt purchased the property, my aunt and uncle, from my grandparents in 1974. Wow. My grandparents bought the property in 1957. In 1957, that was a two-family home. Um, I was born in 1962, and I have childhood memories of going through a little half door that was required by the building inspector so that the apartment unit could access the electric panel in the basement. That door is still there today. It was required when I did my renovation in 05 by Kevin Schultz that that door remain. And it's a door that the kids go through today and it's a little doggy door that goes back and forth. Um, that property has existed as a two family since my family can recall. Um, I've chased what evidence I could through the building department and assessor's office to the best of my ability. When I did, I did a major renovation in 04, 05, and I was almost certain I found some records from the 50s. They, were, they, they weren't there. I did a research recently, and the, the most recent records I could find of its two-family status was in 77, 76, 77. I provided all this to a town attorney. Um, so I have provided um, a series of building permits. There's about eight of them that were obtained from my uncle, Norman Parsons, between 1976 and 1984 um, for the garage for a porch on the side. Those are the two things that create the, the, the conflict with the seven foot setback. Um, hmm. I'm here today because like town attorney expressed, I'm having difficulty selling and conveying the property. It's under contract to be sold. The buyer cannot move forward with financing until these deed, hmm. deed restrictions are modified. Yeah. So I'm not here requesting these modifications so that I can expand or do anything to my property. I'm simply here asking that they be modified so that I can move on and sell the property. Uh, yeah. All the work that I did in 05, I did extensive renovations, um, were done with building permit by right. I didn't request or seek any variances from side yard setbacks mm -hmm. or front yard setbacks, nor did I um, um, 
violate any deed restrictions. They were heavily enforced by, uh, by Kevin Schultz. Um, I did an expansion in the center of the lot that all conformed with the building envelope and it all it simply did was attach the house to a detached garage. So it's now a, an attached garage, an attached two-stall garage. Yeah. So my house actually had, has, has three or four bedrooms in the main house depending how you use it. It has a small eight by nine room on the second floor that we use as an office. It does not even contain a closet, but some people in, in beach situations, you know, that would be clearly a bedroom with a small single bed in it. The apartment, when I purchased it, did have two bedrooms. I eliminated one and made it a larger bedroom. So I've, I've already reduced the bedrooms to four or five, depending on how you look at it. One in the apartment and three or four in the main home. Hmm. So in terms of um, conformance with those restrictions, I haven't made it any worse. Um, made it a little bit better. There are issues that have existed for a long time, and I'm simply trying to sell the property. Yeah. Do, do you have any more comments? That's it. Okay. Anyone else from the public wishing to speak or to say anything? Any questions? Okay. We'll bring it back to the board. I mm -hmm. have a little information. Okay. You want to go ahead? Sure. Yes. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Whoops. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Uh, again, this is uh, like the prior situation where you're, we're looking at restrictions that were imposed as sort of a blanket on many neighborhoods, but without particularization to property. Uh, I'm happy to learned from Mr. Dufresne that he can trace back the, the uh, two family back to a point where it was legal. Uh, uh, the um, two families were allowed in this zone up, up until 1970. Uh, zoning came into effect in 1949. Mm -hmm. The property was built in 1938, according oh, to tax okay. records. Mm -hmm. And so uh, up until 1973, this was uh, a... Uh, would, would, would be legal as a two-family, and so it, it pre-existed that, and actually, it, if it was put in place in 1957, it pre-existed at a time when it was uh, legal under the prior leases as well. So I think that's something that it's a problem for his sale, but it's not a problem in terms of the zoning or anything like that. Hmm. Uh, the number of bedrooms. Um, <coughs> Has had never come up before, but I understand why it's a problem now and uh, could be eliminated without a problem. In terms of the setbacks, there are three different places on the, on the property where there are setbacks that are violated. Um, I don't know when each of the, uh, I don't know when the one on the side was put in or the, uh, the one on the front. Uh, if you told me it was there in 1938, that was before there was ever zoning. So. Wow. So with regards to the front, I have a family photo where I'm being held in my sister's arms. I'm a, an infant. I was born in 62. We're standing in front of that front porch. Um, so I have that evidence. Um, with regards to, um, I brought my mom here tonight. She uh, was born in 1932. She was 25 years old when her parents bought the house. She has clear recollection of it, and she'll be happy to speak in terms of its two-family nature at that point in time. I wasn't born, but she can speak to that. And so I brought her along. Um, the side setback, I did find a building permit for a porch. I'm not clear if it was that porch or not. I'm not sure. They refer to a porch. Um, there are some drawings and sketches that, are so, that, that, that go along with the building permit applications that clearly show a two-family house. Uh, I I've also provided photos from 1971. The tenants of that apartment, he was a Lawrence police officer. His children bought a cottage to the rear of this house off my, off my uncle also. The, the, the maiden name was Dunn. Um, Joyce Beauchene Dunn is, currently owns 189 Kings Highway. She sent me a photo of her holding her son at a two-year-old birthday party in the apartment, and he's in his early 50s now. So she guessed it was about 48 years old, about 1971, in the apartment. And, and, and I took pictures of the apartment tonight to show the same shelving and backdrop as some mm -hmm. of those photos. So um, you know, I tried to chase the history to the best of my ability and the best I could. Yeah, the, the setbacks are a problem with many structures in the in the lease land program. In mm -hmm. fact, there are some yeah. buildings that cross over the line, yeah. the property lines, 
Uh, so again, uh, when these were imposed, it, it poses a problem, especially when it comes time to sale. The only problem that I saw permit-wise was that for the, for the garage in the rear, uh, when the building permit was issued, there was a drawing that said it would be eight feet from the rear property line, whereas now it, me it actually measures four feet. There's actually a back right bump out in the garage that a workbench was built into. My uncle was an electrician, and the whole interior of that, that garage when I bought it was bins, and he had all his electrical equipment. And he created uh, uh, an appendage off the garage that makes it even closer than his building permit, and I did see that as well. So whether, whether he got official approval for that or not, I'm not sure. Yeah. So does that create any problems, the four-foot? Uh, well, my the, family the, owned the house be right there on the other side of that. Yeah, the board can give relief from, <clears throat> from the deed restrictions uh, if they so choose, and the uh, the only problem there would be whether it's a zoning problem. So mm -hmm. I, I did again, research. Um, my neighbor at 911 went through this process, and also a property at 817. And, and the wording I saw in those approvals were that the the setback restrictions were modified, but that they comply with local building setbacks and or any <coughs> uh, decision by the uh, zoning board of appeals. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think that would be helpful and hopeful in my situation. So that any, any future owner still has to go to vote, Zone and Board of Appeals for anything they want to do, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, Mark, do you have a recommendation? Because this is certainly an unusual situation, I think. Uh, well, it, this is one where if, if there are nonconformities, they all they go, all go back a long way. Right. Uh, with the exception of maybe that bump out on the garage. That was yeah. 76. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That was a later permit. I think it was, I think it was 79. Right, right. So um, I think you know if it, these these this particular one has been around for a very long time oh, yeah. without yeah. complaints, yeah. and uh, this is not a situation where someone's developing the property further. Mm -hmm. uh, they're merely selling it as is. So uh, I have no problem if the board wishes to proceed to grant the relief and with that language that's suggested. So we don't have to worry about the number of public hearings. This would be the one and only. Oh no, we, we necessarily oh, have to do that. To so uh, this is hearing number one. Hearing number one, just like the other one. With uh, two more. Just the, we we've arranged this so that there will be a, a special meeting for the actual vote. Excellent. Uh, okay. Timing wise. Uh, okay. When when the timing on both of these two was scheduled the first time, it wasn't wasn't realized that the second yeah. hearing would have fallen on Veterans Day when yeah. you weren't meeting. Right. So we have to observe those time frames. Excellent. And, and I do appreciate else that. At the board wanting to speak? Could I just clarify, so the second public hearings for both of these will be December 2nd? Is that? Yes. Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak? This property's been that way for years. Okay. I go back maybe a couple years beyond you. and. I know the uh, Parsons when they live there, and that yeah. it, it's always it's been a, Parsons place. Mm -hmm. It's always been a two-family, as far as I can remember. So I, I have no problems with it. I watched the minutes of the 28th October 28th hearing. The, it was a mis, there was a misscheduling, and and you, and you stated the same thing. Yeah, but I, I do appreciate the um, mm -hmm. the um, fact that you're making a special hearing for me on the 9th. Yeah. I just want you to know that I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank, thank you for your research too. Thank you, thank you very much. We appreciate it. You've Thank got you. a special mom who will let you use her birthday. <laughs> Excuse me? You've got a special mom who will let you use her birthday. Mom, would you like to speak? We brought you here. A lot of women <laughs> wouldn't do that. Mom had a hip replacement three weeks ago. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. You dragged her out. And I dragged her out. She wasn't <laughs> nice. happy with me. Nice guy. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, All right. Are we, are we going to go to the... Um, USS Virginia first. Public, public comment. 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 Gonna, okay. They're having um, fun here. This uh, is their night off. Well, Christine, oh, yeah. Christine sure that mentioned fun. that we would the other <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyone wishing public comment this evening? Please join us. Good evening. Mark McFarland, 3 Warner Lane. This is going to be a tiny bit awkward because what I like to do is just simply read uh, correspondence that I sent um, as an email to each one of you selectmen. I figure if I read it out loud, we're all getting it. And I know you haven't had time to address it. I think I sent it late on a Friday. 
So my request in this is simply moving forward, perhaps the next, um, the next meeting you have. But rather than off the cuff, I thought I'd just read it. So um, I wrote, Dear uh, Select Board Members, I'm writing seeking clarification and better understanding of the town's decision to grant one part-time employee health benefits <clears throat> and what that may mean for other part-time town employees. And so that you all know, I'm a resident, have been for 23 years, and I'm also a rather recently hired part-time town employee. Also, my understanding of this whole matter, this issue is uh, limited. What I know is what I have read on local media. So I haven't gone back and watched meetings or, or attended. But my first reaction to reading that the board felt it appropriate to offer one town employee, which is Mr. Welsh, health care benefits as a future part-time employee was bewilderment. How do they, the selectmen, reconcile with conscience offering to one what is de uh, denied to so many? But then I thought, hey, this board is opening the door for the rest of us, for those of us part-time employees to be offered the same opportunity. So I hope moving forward I'll be offering you thanks. But I do hope that the board will have an open an informative discussion at the earliest possible, long before town meeting, to explain to the residents as well as those of us employees how benefits and part-time employment are handled for town employees moving forward. So thank you, and I hope to become more enlightened at the next board meeting. And I have lots and lots of other thoughts, but I think maybe more appropriate after uh, you have collected your thoughts, if that's the way it's going to work, um, and I can hear what they are, then I'd offer mine. I may be jumping the gun, um, but I'm certainly happy to share some of my thoughts as well if anybody wants to hear them in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone no. else wishing public comment this evening? Good evening, Charlie. Good uh, Charlie Preston, 47 Great Path. I want to make this quick community announcement tomorrow at 5 o'clock. The E Street Bandstand upstairs, <laughs> there's a meeting for the State Parks Community Meeting. They do one in the spring and the fall. It's 5 to 6.30. Another thing was the, the parking at the beach. I came in here for it last year. Hopefully, it'll be the same, that people can park in the town lot in front of the police station during the snow ban from November 15th to March 15th. And I'm hoping that we could possibly get the marquee sign. I came in and asked for that last year. I think it was in possession of Public Works last. For an informational sign, it's an old manual marquee, and you might be able to put the tides up there. And, and maybe if Public Works works the, with the police department, they can get through with the plow operator who I, you know, lives down the beach, and they can coordinate and try to get people to hug, you know, snuggle up. So when they when they plow, make it easier for the plow guy. And I, I hope that. I know there's no back and forth here. But going forward, you know, I hope we can do that. On another note, I think I read that the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, was it the, did the staff from the crew there work on the King, Kids' Kingdom? Oh, yeah. I read sure that? Did. Oh, yeah. I want to thank applaud you. you guys and say thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else wishing public comment this evening? Seeing none, we'll move, in, move to announcements and community calendar. Mrs. Wolsey. I just... I just have a question as I guess a spin-off from what Mr. McFarland This is announcements said. and community calendar. Do you have well, any good announcements or community calendar? Well, announcements. I think we ought to check. I would like to see, uh, I guess, from uh, all the departments, individuals who Mrs. are working. Mrs. Wolseley, this is announcements and community calendar. You have none. Regina? Um, Charlie took one of mine. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Thursday, there's a couple things going on. The firefighters' annual chili cook-off is 6 p.m. at Wally's. And also, the SOS Recovery Center, I know we all got uh, an invitation to that. And I, I have to work, so I unfortunately can't go. But it's Thursday also at One Lafayette from uh, 9 o'clock in the morning? 9, 9 to noon. 9, 9 to noon. noon. Yeah. And that's it. So Thursday's a busy day. Mr. Waddell? Yes, last Thursday evening, the Hampton Rotary Club uh, gave out its Distinguished uh, Citizen of the Year to Michael McMahon from the Fire Department, Captain in the Fire Department, longtime 
uh, employee. There was a good representation uh, from the uh, fire department there. He, he was very surprised about it, which was really good. Didn't have any idea that it was going to happen. So it was a real good event, and there was a, a great person to put it on, to give it to. Rusty. Come on, sir. Thanks. Yeah, congratulations to Mr. McMahon. He comes from a Captain. nice family that does a lot of good things for the town of Hampton. Yes, they do. Um, next, we have approval of minutes, October 28, 2019. I'll so move. I'll second. All those in favor? Unanimous. And... Uh, November 4th, 2019, non-public session. I have a comment on that. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I meant to bring this up last meeting and I forgot. Uh, during the non-sealed portion of the non-public session, the Board of Selectmen unanimously agreed to give the Deputy of Public Works, Jennifer Hale, she's in the audience tonight, a salary adjustment of $8,407. And like I said, I meant to bring this up last time in public session, but I didn't. And I know the Budget Committee is meeting tomorrow night, so I just wanted to uh, state that publicly. Good. And Mr. Waddell. I'm set. Rusty. All set. Um, Who made the motion? So I'll make a motion that we accept. I'll and second. second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Next, we have the consent agenda. Donation of $1,000 from Service Credit Union for Parks and Recreation Tree Lighting Event. Two, 2019 Equalization Municipal Assessment Data Certificate. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Next, we have <coughs> um, <laughs> the USS Virginia Command Staff. Please join us at the table. Sure. Go on. Yeah. You can pull another table, chair over there, Mike, for one There's of them. There's a chair right there. Yeah. Good evening. Jennifer. We also have somebody else from your committee in the back of the room if they want to come up too. Yeah, would, please uh, join uh, us. Up at the. You want to hold? Yeah. You want to come up? I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> well, we um, there for would like support. to say thank you to uh, the command staff for doing all the nice things that have been done here in Hampton, and thank you for coming in this evening. Um, if we go back uh, to. Uh, 2018, we've had the placking, which I guess that was well, arrival. the arrival. Arrival, yeah. Arrival, yeah. Uh, they've taken part in the pig roast of that year, the Christmas tree lighting, and the Christmas parade. They participated in those events. Um, in 2019, there was a ski trip, uh, state park cleanup, where they worked hard, and uh, this some a surfing event. Uh, change of Command, Another Pig Roast, Seafood <laughs> Festival, South Beach Picnic, um, and the gazeta, they uh, put the health of the sh shrubs at the gazebo and the Smutty Nose outing. Um, they participated. So they've done a lot of things here in Hampton, and um, a lot of people have talked about it, and we really appreciate it. Thank you for coming and being such a good participants. Sir. Yeah, I'll just start out by saying that uh, the, on behalf of the USS uh, Virginia Committee, and, yeah. and, and Mark is, is one of the members here, is here, and so is uh, Regina. Regina is uh, one of the members. Uh, we wanted to uh, introduce the, the command staff. We wanted to bring them in and uh, introduce them to, the, to yourselves and the community. So um, we've been uh, meeting, uh, you know, once a month uh, since pretty much the September uh, 2018, uh, you know, with them. Uh, almost all the months and like I said uh, Regina's been there with us we've uh, we meet upstairs uh, so I just kind of use it as an advertisement to this the second Monday um, of the month at six o'clock upstairs it's open to the public of course it's a public uh, committee so please uh, please anybody uh, c come in and um, you know join us um, the uh, yeah we have formed a, formed a bond with uh, the crew uh, o over the it's now we actually could say years um, it, it's amazing when you start looking at all the stuff that uh, the chairman just read off, uh, but uh, and it's going to last a little bit longer. We're not sure just when they're going to be departing, but it'll be a while yet, and uh, we, we have plenty more things to, to do with them. And it's been uh, it's been where they've helped us on a lot of things, and and and, and one of the biggest one and more recent was uh, what was the Kids Kingdom, 
uh, that, that has been mentioned. And uh, it was just a tremendous number of people that they, uh, crew members that they provided. And some of them were pretty big. They were, one guy was whole, whole hand in two 80 uh, pound bags of uh, concrete at once, walking across, <laughs> hauling them. Uh, my goodness gracious. So um, we have commanding officer uh, Michael Poplowski, um Yep here is going to address uh, us in a minute and we have executive t executive officer lieutenant commander justin reeves and chief of the boat uh machinist mate senior chief jesse white and okay. again thank you okay very good and that's yeah. that's uh, pretty much uh, all i wanted to say except uh, i did want to uh, to thank them again uh, personally and have the uh the, the CO, uh, the skipper, has different terms we use in the Navy, uh, uh, say a few words. Please uh, take the floor. All right, thanks for having us here. Uh, it, it's great to finally uh, get in this room and uh, see some familiar faces. As you can see from that list, you just read the crew likes to eat. So uh, <laughs> keep, the, keep, keep the offers coming and we'll be there. Uh, the relationship we have with the, the town is great. Uh, it gives the crew an opportunity to, to get off the shipyard and to give back. And uh, whether you see it or not, they, they take a lot of pride in that and will always be willing to, to come out and support the community. So we are the, the, the holiday events. We're participating in it again this year. Look forward to uh, many more events coming up. Uh, and the, the official time is uh, till the summer of 2021. So that's, uh -huh. so you, you can definitely say years. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big, big, uh, availability that we're going through but uh this makes it easier do some of you have your families with you or all all three of us yeah. have our families up here and i'd say probably about 90 percent of the crew that that yeah. is nice yeah because uh, i thought yeah. i met some of them and the children at the uh pig roast absolutely yeah yes yeah, so uh like i said the relationship's important and and we're looking forward to more opportunities to to cooperate and, and do things for the community we do appreciate it Thank you. Would you uh, like to speak, Mrs. Wilson? Gentlemen, we are proud of you. Have any of you ever served at Kings Bay? Yeah, yeah because that was my daughter's last posting. It's in <laughs> Georgia. Yeah, very nice. We're proud of all of you. I just want to say thank you for all the work you've done, and even some of your spouses joined in the uh, building of King's Kingdom, which was uh, absolutely. Very nice to see you guys really help the Parks and Recs get that done. It looks so. great. Sounds yeah, like it does. It looks really good. Weekend. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your service and thank you for what you do. Sir. Absolutely, I'm sure your, your your families will enjoy the uh, the tree lighting. There's, there's a lot yeah. that goes on downtown. Uh, there's uh, a bunch of the restaurants that have food and stuff like that, along with the tree lighting and the and the uh, wagon rides and the Christmas carol. And so it's it's a really fun thing for those that didn't get there. And then obviously the the parade the next day, which is probably one of the close to one of the biggest parades, uh, Christmas parades in, Ham in, in New Hampshire. So uh, and you guys can be part of that. And uh, the uh, committee that's doing the parade was, was really happy you guys were going to be in it again this year. So Absolutely. we thank you for your service and thank you for, you know, coming down and enjoying some of our hospitality too. Sure. <laughs> Keep eating and maybe we'll be looking for a new sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for coming yeah. in this year. Thank you. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And when you retire, you can come back again. Mm. Next, we have Scott Egan and Taylor uh, Payne, auditors with Plazek and Sanderson. With the 2018 auditors report, please join us. If you guys, you guys, yeah. yeah. You don't have to wait for the whole meeting. So. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Um, Thank you for having, having us here this evening. Um, again, I'm Scott Egan. This is Tyler Payne. Um, I'm a senior manager with Plaza and Sanderson, and Tyler's the manager in charge of your audit. Um, we're here to present the 2018 annual financial report. Um, I just wanted to start off before I kind of went through some of the customary figures, uh, see if the board um, had any issues they wanted addressed up front, or if you'd like me to proceed you know, through the report initially. Please um, go ahead and 
start the jump in yeah. whenever whenever a question arises. We, we have a you. copy of your report. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, wanted to review start uh, just review the audit opinion for the financial statements. Um, and the town has received an unmodified opinion on all opinion units, um, which is basically stating that the financial statements are fairly stated in all material respects in accordance with accounting standards. Um, and that comprises the different components of the town. Uh, the governmental activities, which uh, is the town as a whole, it includes all long-term assets, infrastructure, debt, including your retirement obligations, uh, your general fund, um, and permanent fund, uh, both of which are individual major funds. And then the remaining activity of the town is, is grouped together. Those are all your uh, special revenue funds, your conservation fund, police detail, mm -hmm. and your capital projects. Those are all grouped together as well in one opinion unit. And um, essentially those have been found to have been you know, fairly presented um, in terms of their you know, balances and activity and presentation and required disclosures for the year. Um, again, this is the same opinion that the town received uh, in prior years um, once the capital assets were uh, brought up to date. Um, so again, on the, on the correct path in terms of um, the financial reporting. There are some significant changes in this report yet again um, related uh -oh. to changes in some of the accounting standards. Um, if you recall a few years back, there were some major changes that brought some pension liabilities related to the New Hampshire retirement system on to your report. Um, they've changed now the standards for reporting other post-employment benefits, and that's mainly health care. Um, and you'll see in this year's report, um, those obligations are reported under GASB statement number 75 which has um, re, um, recalculated and, and um, expanded the scope of what is considered a, a other post-employment retirement benefit. Um, and it comes in two components. Um, one, there is a new liability presented, which is related to the medical subsidy, uh, that benefit that's provided in the New Hampshire retirement system plan. Under previous accounting standards, there was no requirement to calculate or disclose this. Um, in your individual financial statements, it was calculated at the plan level, but it was never passed down, similar to how you reported retirement. Right. That benefit or that liability um, has now been reported. The town did previously report a a local plan. Um, we have it listed in the report here as the Town of Hampton plan. Um, that is related to something called an implicit rate subsidy. And we've talked about this in the past, so I won't belabor it too much, but just for the for the public's and general um, general knowledge, this basically is an actuarial liability that's calculated due to the fact that the plan has a blended rate where Retirees and active employees pay the same health care premiums. Um, so hypothetically, not hypothetically, the, the blended rate is, <laughs> is higher, I'll choose my words carefully, um, is higher due to the fact that retirees are in the plan making active employee premiums higher. And there's a projection of the long-term impact of this, and that is presented as a liability on your financial statements. Um, hmm. This has been reported for a number of years, but they changed the methodology and some of the assumptions that you're allowed to use to standardize this. And, and the easiest way I can explain the change for this particular balance is it went from a net concept to a gross concept, so the numbers got bigger. Um, hmm. But there's no fundamental change in the activities um, or the, you know, the, the general financial position of the town as a result. This is an accounting change and should be viewed distinctly from your other long-term liabilities if you're, say, um, you know, incurring debt to um, you know, uh, improve a capital asset or you know, uh, church street pumping station, any mm -hmm. of those things. It's distinct from that in that um, there's not a, a bond schedule that you pay down. Um, 
that terminates at the end of the 20 years. Um, this is something that's managed through the rates within the system. Um, and as rates are reset annually, um, they're designed to, to pay this down over time. Mm. Um, and, and we can touch on that later if anyone wants to go into more detail. Um, I also did want to touch on there was a single audit this year, uh, which is a federal compliance audit. And that's as a result of um, some environmental protection uh, federal funds related to um, the clean water program, um, mostly in regards to Church Street. In total, there was about $1.5 million in federal funds expended. So we, in addition to the normal audit that we do, did perform a compliance audit. And I, that's at the back of this report that we'll go over. But um, again, um, is a little bit, um, it, it's distinct from the financial statement audit. and in general um, pulls a little bit more compliance testing and review into the audit for your overall procedures so that we can say that the town is complying with rules, laws, and regulations mm -hmm. as well um, as required by the federal government in mm -hmm. receipt of those monies. Um, I actually would like to go to the back of the report to page 52 to report on the budgetary results for the year for the town. Um, the wonderful thing about governmental financial reporting is you have your numbers presented in three different formats. Um, you have your budgetary statements, which are going to be what uh, the board is most familiar with and, and what is used for tax rate setting and reported to the Department of Revenue. Um, you then have fund-based statements, which are uh, focused on current financial resources and your use of those resources over the years. And then you have your governmental activities, which are a long-term view, and that pulls on all those long-term assets and debt that we just spoke about. Um, if you turn to uh, page 52 again, um, this is your schedule of estimated and actual revenues. Um, in total, um, the town had, uh, the town received $938,000 uh, in revenue in excess of amounts budgeted, which is about a 3.2% favorable result. Um, the main contributors to that were um, excess property tax collections, uh, some unanticipated federal monies, uh, some FEMA storm money, mm. um, and some direct federal grants from the Department of Justice mm. and Homeland Security. And also um, the Transfer in from the real estate trust was higher than anticipated based upon actual earnings that are transferred over on a monthly basis. So that's a that's a variable figure. So a, a variance in that line isn't unusual depending on um, you know the underlying performance of of your portfolios. Um, but again, on the revenue side, um, a 3.2 almost a million a million dollar um, favorable result. Um, on the expenditure side, um, things were things were pretty close. Um, again, this has a if you review on page 53 and 54, um, a 2.1 percent favorable result. You have $618,000 um, of unexpended appropriations, including all encumbrances and commitments at year end. Um, there weren't too many significant variances. Um, the main con contribution to that result were insurance and benefit related items in, in your general government expenditures. Um, so again, it was a, a positive year um, budgetary wise in terms of the revenue and the expenditures. <coughs> That'll take us to an analysis of your fund balance and schedule of changes and unassigned fund balance on page 55. And this is uh, previously was called the unreserved fund balance or some people call it surplus. Technically it's unassigned fund balance. Um, you started the year uh, with $7,693,000. You ended the year with $8,859,000. Uh, $8, it's an increase of uh, $1,166,000, about a 15% increase. Uh, the main uh, drivers of that, again, were the revenue surplus that we just detailed and the unexpended balance of the appropriations. Um, uh, which resulted in, you know, an addition of 1.5 uh, million uh, into your unassigned fund balance. 
previously last year the board voted four hundred twenty thousand dollars from your unassigned fund balance to reduce the tax rate mm -hmm. that comes off of that to net out into your overall um, your overall increase um, again there are some other change small changes in fund balance but uh, you ended with uh, eight million eight hundred fifty nine thousand mm. dollars in unassigned fund balance yeah. um, next I will um, roll into the fund financial statements which you can find on uh, let's see here page 11 <coughs> Um, and this is your governmental fund balance sheet. And again, as I discussed uh, in going over the opinion letter, you have your general fund, uh, your permanent funds. Both are individual, uh, considered individual major funds and considered individually for your opinion. And your other governmental funds, which are your special revenue and capital project funds. Hmm. Um, again, uh, general fund, um, you have $23,695,000 in cash at year end, $2.6 million in investments, um, taxes receivable uh, of $2,275,000. Um, and you can see uh, it goes down the line for total assets of uh, just under $30 million. Liabilities, uh, most significantly are, is your intergovernmental payable. Most of that is related to uh, tax collections uh, of the total taxes that are eventually due over to the school district. Um, and beyond that, you have almost equal amounts in your accounts payable and accrued salaries at 246000 um, At year end, um, the total fund balances for your general fund, not just the unassigned, um, stand at $13,334,000. Um, of that, and there is a a reconciliation to this number, an unassigned fund balance of 8320000 You will notice that that number is less than the budgetary amount. For this statement, there's some more restrictive revenue recognition criteria in terms of timing of payments. So um, this only includes your property taxes that were collected within 60 days of year end, resulting in a difference to what the state uses, which is your overall property tax collections net of an allowance for uncollectible. So it's a little bit more of a generous number and that's what the tax rate is, is set on, but accounting standards require you to also present it um, in this format as well. Um, then moving up from the unassigned fund balance and we're going from least restrictive to most restrictive sources of funds, um, you have $586,000 in assigned fund balance. Um, Four million in committed fund balance. Um, that's mostly trust fund monies that are designated um, for specific purposes once appropriated into your trust funds. Mm. Um, restricted uh, fund balance of 172,000. Um, those are external restrictions, grants, and other um, <coughs> again externally restricted funds, maybe state restrictions um, on the monies that dictate how those are. Uh, going to be spent and then non-spendable fund balance um, that's prepaid items and inventory items like tax deeded property um, those are not in cash form so they're deemed non-spendable um, and just set aside from your general funds um, if we go to page 13 um, just to look at the overall performance of the general fund in terms of activity. We ran through the, the major um, components of uh, the, the budgetary results and those numbers will flow in here. Uh, you'll see that there was a net change in fund balance of 1,015,000 and again it was uh, starting at 12,319,000 ending at 13,334,000 mostly from those uh, results of operations in terms of excess revenue and, and under expenditure of appropriations. Um, if you look here um, in terms of, you know, some of the contributions to this, we already discussed transfers in from the real estate trust um, exceeded the amounts budgeted um, and revenues, uh, the other revenues that we had mentioned. Um, within your permanent funds, um, Again, the majority of these being related to the real estate trust. Um, 
at year end, there was an investment balance of $20,538,000, um, cash and clearing accounts of $175,000. Uh, you had a non-spendable fund balance of $20,367,000 and restricted of $173,000. In the permanent funds, as the name kind of denotes, uh, these are funds that are legally uh, restricted. The principal must remain intact. You do have the ability to, to spend or appropriate the earnings on these funds, and that would be the breakout between the non-spendable and the uh, restricted. The majority of this comes from the real estate trust fund, which is transferred out, so typically that um, restricted amount is, is limited at year end. Um, in looking at your uh, results in the permanent funds, um, there are some disclosures here. Um, you'll see under miscellaneous revenue, uh, there's a negative $669,000. That is uh, broken out separately within the disclosures in the audit. Really what that is is um, approximately $1.2 million in investment earnings, dividends, real, real funds, mm -hmm. and a um, uh, $1.8 million um, unrealized loss in market value based on mostly stock market performance near year end. If anyone looked at their 401k statement, mm -hmm. we're all familiar with what happened there. But again, not, not mm -hmm. a realized loss, but um, you know, contributes to the overall performance and, and the decline of that fund. Um, again, $851,000 transferred out um, in terms of the earnings and the remainder essentially being that, that net loss in market value mm. uh, from reporting. Um, your other go governmental funds um, on the balance sheet on page 11, 1.1 million in cash, 1.5 million in intergovernmental receivables, uh, amounts due from the state and other agencies, um, 832,000 in accounts payable, um, mostly resulting from construction type payments, larger payments on some of the mm. uh, capital and infrastructure projects that you had going on. Um, fund balance wise, you ended at 1.49 million. Uh, 1.2 million of that is um, committed and 276,000 is restricted. Um, again, um, there is a, um, you know, an aggregated balance here on page 13 of the revenues and expenditures and I won't go over them this evening um, unless there are specific questions but if you're looking for additional detail beginning on page um, let's see here it's going to be 56 um, schedule 4 um, there's going to be some disaggregated information not a required component of your financial of the basic financials but we always disclose that so you know what the individual results were for any particular fund. Um, and the fund continues to our final set of statements, the government-wide statements on pages 9 and 10. And um, again, here, a lot of the numbers will be familiar. Um, you'll see the addition of capital assets, land um, in construction and progress of 18 million, and other capital assets net of depreciation of 32 million. Um, giving you total assets of $104 million. Uh, deferred outflows of resources, these are amounts uh, related to uh, primarily to your uh, pension and OPEB amounts of $3.6 million. These are, are like an asset, but just a separate category for governmental reporting. Um, total liabilities uh, sat at $68,580,000. Again, we ran through the majority of these, the 15 million in school payable, and your long-term liabilities you see due within one year, uh, 2,048,000, and due in more than one year, 49,610,000. This number is inclusive of those pension, OPEB, and your traditional long-term uh, obligations, um, both your bonds payable, uh, things like your compensated absences payable for retirement that, that the town would actually pay based on um, benefits earned uh, and accrued time that would be paid out if employees left and the, uh, the majority of that though being um, related to your retirement figures. Um, deferred inflows, um, similar situation where um, there are 
the majority of that's going to be related to your um, to your pension amounts. Um, leaving you with net position, just kind of the, the version of fund balance for these statements. Uh, a net investment of capital assets of thirty-one million three hundred fifteen thousand, uh, restricted of twenty million five hundred forty thousand. Again, those trust monies that we talked about, and an unrestricted deficit of fourteen million three hundred five thousand. Um, and again, that is a result mainly of those uh, pension New Hampshire retirement liabilities um, being recorded onto this statement. But um, you know, in terms of a current financial position, you do want to look at this overall and look at the trend of this. But a more meaningful num number in terms of uh, immediacy or, or you know financial results or kind of your stewardship side of things um, would be your your governmental fund and budgetary numbers. Mm -hmm. um, on page ten, you'll see. Um, just again, a different formatting, um, different layout of the uh, results of your operations. Um, it matches on, on the statement of activities here. It matches um, the program revenues uh, with the basically functions that they benefit to show you a net operating cost of some of your departments. Um, and just a different presentation. Again, a lot of these numbers you'll find through the other statements. Um, as I mentioned, um, though, related to the real estate trust, you'll see here um, presented separately, unrestricted investment earnings of 1.2 million, so those are your dividends, uh, et cetera, and a decline in fair market value of investments of 1.8 million. Um, overall, your net position um, of 38 million, uh, started at 38 million, 31,000. Um, it ended at 37550000 a decrease of $480,000. Um, as you can see here on note 20, um, fund balance, um, and as we discussed, there was a new accounting statement, so your net position was restated to reflect the cumulative effect of the adjustments. That can be found at note 20 uh, of the financial statements. And um, again, that's the, the major impact of bring on the new accounting statement. And uh, if I go to note 20, the total impact of that on your financial statements was a, uh, essentially a decrease in your net position of $4,861,000 was the, the impact of that accounting change um, and change in methodology for those liabilities. So um, at this point, I just wanted to open it up to see if there are any areas that um, <laughs> the board needed clarification or uh, wanted some further information on Questions, uh, Mrs. Wolsey? <laughs> I'm still marveling that you can do what you do. Um, I just have one quick question. The trustees of the trust funds in Hampton, I've been very proud of them for, for not taking risks and for being really careful in what they're doing. Do you have an opinion on, on the trust funds per se? Do you, does it look um, you know, as if we're managing well and, and all that. Well, I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't say I have an, wouldn't be appropriate for me necessarily have an opinion. I can say what we do in context of not just looking at the numbers and going beyond the numbers. Yeah. Uh, we do verify that there's an investment policy um, okay. that, you know, again, is at a kind of a prudent man standard. Um, and we evaluate that the investments made are in accordance mm -hmm. with the policy okay. um, and that that's updated <coughs> regularly and that there's proper documentation and review and analysis of the investments, which, you know, I can say in, in reviewing the audit that uh, it is uh, reviewed and, and um, you know, managed actively, I would say. Mm -hmm. So um, it, we, you know, see a lot of governments. Yeah. Um, we do about 175 audits in New Hampshire, wow. governmental audits. And uh, not all of them are as big as Hampton. Yeah. Um, and, and some of those you will see less, less review and um, fiduciary mm -hmm. uh, responsibility in, in, from your trustees. So I think I can, you know, can say on the average that, yeah, there's, they're reviewed, um, you know, there are different investment philosophies and how yeah. aggressive people mm -hmm. want to be. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, we do look at those baseline items to make sure that you're yeah. complying at least with your own policy and, and intention. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I believe they have three separate policies depending on the type of trust that they're, they're investing uh, in as well. Okay. Because I've been very proud of them over the years, and it looks like they're not taking strange risks or doing something to, to cause damage to the public's money. No, no. And as Tyler mentioned, again, they, they do have distinct policies. Longer-term monies will be invested differently than, um, you know, capital monies that mm -hmm. may be needed in a shorter time frame. So uh, that there aren't surprises of, you know, a million-dollar loss that you have to realize when you're when you're looking to yeah. you know build a fire station so well, you're very Excuse brave me. to go through all those figures regina um yeah thank you for the presentation uh i appreciate it and i appreciate the audit that you do um i just have a couple things i wanted to bring up while you're here mm -hmm. that you could uh verify you talked about the unassigned fund balance quite a bit yes and as of 12 31 that was about 8.3 million um, that might have been budgetary. Yeah, kind of that's, the, cruel. that's the um, fund um, number. For state purposes, um, it's $8.8 .8 um, okay. And that number, it's found in two places. It's on page 15 and, and 55. Then, and 55. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of you know what would have been reported on the annual report, the MS-535 to the Department of Revenue um, is the 8.8. .8 and when the board um, is looking to use some of that fund balance that's the document they're going off of to say this is your number mm -hmm. um, you know again you have fund balance if it were closer there are instances where the department of revenue would say you can't use that much because it would leave you in a untenable situation mm -hmm. okay so the 8.8 .8 million is as 8.8 .8 is your is your is your budgetary on a okay. fund balance yes and that that's that's an appropriate level per state, what the state recommends? There's, there's, no, there's no true guideline. There's a lot of ways that um, you can look at it. I think the, you know, the, it's unique to every community. Um, right. You know, the bare minimum that, that is recommended, and there's, this isn't official right. anywhere, but is, you know, you want to have two, uh, two months of operating expenditures <coughs> at least, but depending upon your uh, community, you may need more than that, uh, depending on how you budget for mm -hmm. your capital items. Um, do you have trust funds that are at your disposal in emergency situations? Um, things of that nature. Mm. So my next <coughs> question relates to that on the capital assets mm -hmm. footnote on page 29. Infrastructure shows that about 51 million but its depreciation shows at almost 37 million, which is about 72 percent. Correct. Depreciated. Could you just explain? I mean, I know what depreciation mm -hmm. is, and but uh, maybe a lot of people don't. What happens when an asset gets depreciated? Sure. Uh, basically, all that all that depreciation is trying to do is assign um, an expense um, of an asset over. Uh, a current period so if you have a building that you're going to use for 50 years um, in one way in, in the budgetary way you have to be compliant and say if it were a 20 million dollar building that we didn't go over the 20 million dollars but for your long-term manager that it's really an asset that is going to serve you over a number of years and the depreciation is just taking an annual percentage of of your value to reflect kind of that that net realizable amount or net net value of your building that in you know if it's going to last 20 years you're going to need another one in 20 years yeah. um, so it's you don't want to consider that a 20 million dollar asset in in year 19 right. uh, it's going to be a 1 million dollar exactly. asset because you're going to be budgeting to buy the next one so when you're depreciating and not adding in essence your assets are Cor I mean, they're taking wear and tear. So Correct. the point I'm trying to get to for the public is having that unassigned a fund balance to a town like Hampton is very important because we have had many cir circumstances where things have happened and we do need the funds. Yeah, so I, I mean, think having a uh, modest amount in that is important. Yeah, I, there's, there's a number, you know, again, resources. Um, you can appropriate funds from unassigned fund balance. Um, you know, if your agents to expend on your trust funds, you can, uh, you know, uh, appropriate the funds from those sources. But yes, you would want to have that for 
for planning and whether that is amounts you appropriate annually into a reserve fund or a replacement fund, um, you know, or if it's in the unassigned fund balance, you still ultimately need an appropriation for it, but it would give you the ability if there were something to come up, you, you know, again, have that ability to fund some of these items from unassigned fund balance without raising taxes mm -hmm. if you were to bring it to a vote. So it gives you another source yeah, beyond your trust yeah. funds that you could that you could tap into in the event that you know something unexpected or yeah. unforeseen or unplanned. I just know when our current town manager came here that unassigned balance was at what was it, Fred? <laughs> Zero. Zero. <laughs> so we didn't have anything to work with, but we do now, so that that's hopeful. And the other thing I just wanted to bring up real quick is um, the pension Mm -hmm. liability I know that came out a few years ago and uh, the, the state has the same thing to deal with but as far as Hampton's concerned I mean what do you see when you look at that could you just explain a little sure. bit sure um, let's take a look at the, the detailed numbers there Tyler has it out um, your net pension liability um, this year would decrease from 25 million nine hundred sixty three thousand to 24 million nine hundred sixty nine thousand um, it's going to be compiled with two different figures. Yeah, and if you if you look at this, I want to just kind of want to highlight too. So you have on this note, I'm looking at page 31, note 13, your long-term liabilities. Um, you have bonds and notes payable at year end of 18 million 872 thousand. Right. Compensated absences of 1.5 million. Those are the uh, yeah. retirement benefits, uh, accrued time benefits. Um, Post closure landfill costs, uh, landfill costs of five hundred fifty nine thousand. Then you have twenty five, almost twenty five million in your net pension liability, and another five point seven in your net other in post employment benefits. So it's by far the largest uh, component of your of your long term debt. Uh, what that number is, though, it, it should be viewed differently, I guess, than your bonds payable. Um, again, this number. Um, I had the opportunity actually when this came out to work with New Hampshire Retirement to do some of the education on this to the NHMA and, and various other organizations. Um, if you were to hypothetically withdraw from New Hampshire Retirement, that's not the number you would pay. Um, that number is, it's an estimate. Um, it takes the total <coughs> pension liability, the total deficit of the plan, and just gives you a pro rata portion based upon your contributions into the plan that year. Uh, so it's just a reflection basically of the of the long-term underfunding of the plan however um, it's managed through rates and the important thing with that liability to know is that again you're going to be on equal footing with any other community um, it's not better or worse for anyone your percentage is based upon what you put in each year so um, the number is going to change it's going to change because of uh, investment rates of return or, or different projections and uh, other actuarial rates. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, there is a plan and the retirement system actuaries um, basically go through and when they reset rates, it's with the idea that this is in kind of a, a closed-ended amortization, meaning ultimately this is going to be paid down. And as long as you're within that program and the actuaries are uh, conforming to that, um, I haven't seen any issues where state plans have, the members have, have had, you know, really adverse um, opinions or adverse issues related to that. It's where uh, you get into um, a situation maybe where a plan uh, isn't planning on actually paying it down. Then there are some different things that, that would kick in, but that doesn't apply to the town of Hampton or the New Hampshire Retirement System plan. So. Perfect. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yes, I just wanted to say that um, <clears throat> the unassigned fund balance for many years was l less than eight million. But it was always uh, it was all. I don't ever remember it being completely gone. The year I came here, <laughs> you, you, this auditor certified seven hundred seven hundred seventy-four thousand dollars, and we had three million dollars worth of unpaid taxes. Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. take a genius to figure out it's zero. Well, we had, I know that many of the boards made decisions to help build that fundraise. So Go all ahead. of the boards since then and before worked to raise the uh, fund balance. And this is the highest it's been, but I've seen it 4 million, 6 million. Um, 
and I, you know, that's why many times we weren't able to put any extra money in it when that's it true. got low like yep. that. But all of the boards all along the way have worked to make it what it is. Jim? Yeah, thank you. Good report. And in just English, <laughs> a little English, that the town is in good shape. The town does a good job of recording everything they spend, recording everything they take in, and keeping the books in good order. You'd say that, yes? Yes, that would be yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the liabilities, those large liabilities, are paid off over a number of years. They're not today. Correct. No, the pension. Mainly the pension mainly comes because the New Hampshire state retirement system got into a mess where they're, what, $5 billion, $4 billion? Correct. Uh, underfunded, yeah. and that they put off onto the towns their portion, or what they figured their Correct. portion was, paying off that that debt. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would, I guess, take that one step further and say it's different in that it's not the same as a bond right. or um, a contract payable that the town yeah. would have. Uh, this is managed by the rates. So when people say, oh, this firefighter gets 20-whatever yeah. percent yeah. towards their retirement, that's not what... A retiree is getting that's putting extra money in to pay down the liability. Right, right. So. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I was in the state house, there was an awful lot thrown around about floating a bond to pay off the whole thing at once and a yep. whole bunch of different ideas to take care of it. None of them are really good. But, uh, <laughs> so it's a mess and we're helping to pay it off. But it's the unsigned fund balance, I think, is important. And it's not a cash account, right? Correct. It's an accounting. Mechanism. Yep. Mm -hmm. yes. Much of that is uncollected property taxes. Right. Because yeah. a lot of people think, where's that $8 million and yeah. can we tap into it today? Um, but it's I not get that. a cash yeah. account. I get that question all the time. And if you look at your cash balance, you know, if you take a look at that, if you have $23 million in the bank at the end of the year, um, $15 million of that belongs to the school. Schools. <laughs> right. um, and then when you go back to the remaining cash, um, there are other obligations on that. So it's really the net effect of um, if you were doing a, you know, a personal financial statement, it's your net worth. It's not a, a true, it's not a where is it number. Uh, if you look at where is your net worth, it's in a lot of yep. places. All right. Mm. Okay, thank you. Good well, job. Let's do it. No, my only thing was it state that, yeah, in plain English that our <laughs> uh, <laughs> accounting office is doing a good job. Our, our, our Town management is doing a good job at running it, and uh, you found no. Yeah, there were no there were no significant findings um, in terms of what we communicate. Um, obviously, there are always routine routine items and areas of improvement, best practices. Um, as a board, what you need to be most concerned with are material weaknesses and significant deficiencies, and those are issues that are significant significant enough that that we would feel. Um, could cause a, a misstatement or a fraud or something to go undetected, um, um, you know, to not be prevented or, or be undetected for a period of time. There was nothing in that, um, you know, in that arena. In the day-to-day -day operations, um, the town does a, a good job of keeping accounts reconciled and, and up to date, um, you know. And again, there's quite a bit of activity moving in and out and revenue that, that needs to be accounted for in the they, you know, do a good job making sure that's, you know, performed routinely and timely. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and thank you for um, everything that you've done and for us and keeping us in order. And thanks uh, to Christy for working so hard with you. Absolutely. Yes. She does thank a great you. job. She yes, does. she does. Yeah. We're proud of her, too. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great night. Yeah, yeah you, you too. Do. Drive careful. Yeah, watch out. It's slippery. <laughs> <laughs> slippery somewhere on the way home. Yeah. <laughs> Next, we have Chris Jacobs, DPW Director, and Jen Hale, DPW Deputy Director. Chris, did you really get time off, truly? Yeah. All right. Yes, I did. <laughs> it wasn't a myth. God, the seat is warm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> The Jen Show, so I'll just uh, all right. stay in support. Oh, all right. Uh, I don't know which one you have first on the agenda. Bypass trailer. Bypass trailer mounted pump. So, uh, this is a request uh, for a new bypass trailer pump. In case you're wondering what that is, 
Uh, it is a pump that is used if a uh, manhole, between manholes there's a pipe, if that pipe breaks and you need to yep. get the flow from one manhole to another, this is a pump that's suitable, able to do it. It is on a trailer, so it is uh, towed behind, it can be moved. Ours is currently of the vintage um, 1991. Uh, it is just not reliable and this is an emergency piece of equipment. Uh, we are asking uh, for the board, uh, or the, yeah, the board to recommend the purchase uh, of this piece uh, from the wastewater development charge account. Uh, the total amount is $51,261. Uh, the account does have the funding uh, in it right now. Uh, and we are asking um, that the board understand that in lieu of putting this out to bid according to the purchasing policy, that this is a government bid price. Okay. So it has already been put out. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't want anyone to think that uh, this item, particular item, is like a dream or a wish item. It was on our radar almost two years ago yeah. because the motor that runs it uh, I think the mechanics are working on it every six months just mm -hmm. to make sure that it's up and running. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a critical piece of equipment and it's actually mounted in a World War II trailer <laughs> that you tow behind a Jeep. So um, it served us well for a very long period of time, but um, we need to uh, move we'll make it along. a motion that we do the bypass trailer. I'll second. All those in favor, unanimous. But Chris, I haven't been complaining at you for getting rid of the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, the second one, uh, this is uh, what we're calling a SCADA purchase. Um, as you know, we are almost there on mm -hmm. our final design and bid documents for the wastewater treatment plant improvements uh, that are intended to go on um, yep. next year. Uh, as part of these improvements and as was identified in the phase one assessment that was done, there are some computer upgrades that need to occur. Um, right now, uh, we're being told by the IT department that our current SCADA system is no longer going to operate on the operating system we have. Yeah. Um, so we don't necessarily have the time or luxury to wait until next year when the whole project is bid as a whole. Uh, so what the IT guys have done, along with our current contractors and engineers, has gone out and looked for the best um, equipment that will work with the future upgrades. So it's just a purchase ahead of time that will um, be used uh, and implemented as part of the overall improvements. Um, the bonus of this is that it is something that comes with um, a service plan. Uh, getting it now before the end of the year, they're actually going to give us a three-year service plan. Uh, so it's right. just a special they're running, I guess, happy holidays or however that may work out <laughs> for all the skate out there. Um, we are looking for a total price of $33,090.72. Uh, it would be funded by what we call Fund 32. This is the Warren article that was approved. Um, it was an anticipated cost, so I don't want anybody to think that we're adding something in. Like I said, this was part of the upgrades. Um, we recommend that the Board of Selectmen authorize the town manager to sign the purchase order uh, in this amount. The uh, request here does not comply with the Town of Hampton purchasing policy, and a waiver is requested uh, because we did not do a sealed competitive bid. Uh, due to the current needs to work with our current system, uh, the research completed not only by the town, but our engineers and in consultation with our skater programmers, uh, this specific product is what we need. So it's a single source, basically. It's basically it is, yes. Mm -hmm. I'll make the motion. I'll second. That we also waive the purchase policy yes, also? Yes. Yes, I'll second. All those in favor, unanimous. I do have one more thing, if you'll let me add it uh, yep, to today's agenda. Uh, we received an email today. We got to watch the news. You saw it first. But um, got an email that said, Dear Jen Hale, we are pleased to advise you that the Board of Directors of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation has approved the $185,799.91 for the site assessment and preliminary designs to mitigate flooding in Hampton, New Hampshire neighborhoods by restoring Hampton Seabrook Estuary Salt Marsh project, pending a successful completion of our fiscal review process. 
This award is provided on the condition that these funds will be matched in matching contributions raised to the town of Hampton. Uh, this is the grant that we applied for a few months back. We have been awarded it. Uh, so this is a huge step in um, adding to what the board and the Warren articles and the town people have already uh, moved on as far as our drainage studies. Uh, in putting this grant together, uh, we teamed with DES and UNH and Fish and Game. Uh, we all put in our matching hours, our time. Uh, the grant, the warm article money is the match that they're fully aware of what we're doing mm. as phase one, and this will take that, uh, taking two to four steps into preliminary design. That's excellent. Excellent. Uh, Very what good. Exactly. Good what area is this for? So it is for, oh, they're calling it the Hampton Seabrook uh, Salt Marsh Estuary. So it is Meadow Pond, Kings Highway, and then. Uh, the harbor, so west of Ashworth, so the mm. same exact two areas that we. So are it's not covering. the area in between. It includes everything. It is connected. Uh, yeah, so because I'm sure that was specified mm -hmm. at the time. When this and was because first that is about. the the salt marsh. I mean, that's the big mm. ecosystem. Uh, this is a National Fish Wildlife Foundation grant, um, so it's looking at the protection of the estuary as a whole. Mm. Okay, great. Make the motion. Or do we need a motion? No motion. I just wanted to let you know that okay. uh, it was there, and I'm sure there will be paperwork and other visits uh, to ask for some motions, but uh, we just got the word today. Thank you. Mr. 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 Chair, yeah. while Chris and Jen are here really quickly, and maybe Fred could help, um, with the uh, dredging of the harbor, is that going to have any effect on public works? Is that going to... Uh, have it any effect on flooding or, or lowering flooding or whatever in that area? It won't change flooding. It won't change no. anything. The no. level of the sea is the sea. You know, oh. All you're doing is making a deeper harbor. No, everybody was hoping that you know you take a little sand out, you'd have a little bit more storage, you know, for the water. Mm. Um, but that's not the purpose of this project. Well, I thought about. It. I thought <coughs> it. But thank you both for what you do. Thank and you. Welcome back, Chris. And thank you. I have a quick question uh, while, yes. I, while you're here. Is the street sweep work working still? Mm. It's pretty much offline for the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, once it gets so cold that the water in the tanks would freeze, uh -huh. uh, we empty it and bench it. I just had Not somebody to ask, ask me uptown. The, the, uh, there's a lot of leaves right in the gutters, right in the downtown area. We can so. ask... Uh, I mean, it certainly at any time can be put back online. I mean, it's not like just needs to be cleaned back out. Again right. Once right. It's, just, we have to be yeah, careful. I saw about, that. And right. I mean, we hit a 50 degree stretch. Then, yeah, we can put it up. Okay. Yep. And I'll, we'll talk to Chris uh, again as first thing in the morning and see if he can get that taken care of. All right. Thank you. And sorry, just will you, fall leaf cleanup is this week. <coughs> fall leaf cleanup is this week. Uh, they started today. Uh, yes. right. We did get our trash trucks that were down last week back. Unfortunately, we had different ones go down this morning, but they're back up and running, so we were on a delay today. Um, so they um, went out in the trucks, which takes two people. Um, it takes more than that. They can't fit as many in. So they're a little bit behind. Uh, we tell everybody, please leave them out. Keep them at the curb. Uh, if you feel you've been missed, meaning, you know, it's Friday and your trash day was Tuesday, Please certainly give us a call. Mm -hmm. If it's Wednesday and your day was Tuesday, just we may be there by end of day. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to catch up each day. Yeah, but when the trash trucks went down, it was amazing. The the, the pickup did go on a little later than usual, mm -hmm. but it, yep. it, did, it did go on. Yep. Thank you for coming in tonight. We appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds um, good. Moving on to the town manager's report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, Public Works has done a good job here. They've uh, they've finished Park Avenue. They've completed the road work up there, uh, the uh, the culvert work, and it's open to normal traffic. The roadway is scheduled to be completely overlaid with new pavement coming next year, and during the pavement period. Okay. Handicapped parking area in the town office is complete except for uh, yes good striping, point. which they finished just yesterday and uh, last Friday, and, and yeah. uh, the erection of signage. So that's done. Yeah, good uh, job on that. Thanks, Public Works. Yes. <clears throat> Work continues on the replacement of the old water main on Mill, Mill Road until freezing weather shuts down or the work is completed. The water main replacement on Route 101 and Church Street is completed, and the trenches have been patched for the winter 
uh, any final cleanup, final cleanup is underway. A large waterlogged tree trunk on Place Cove Beach is being removed by hand by a contractor with powered equipment. Um, it is not allowed, the powered equipment is not allowed on the beach, so they have to haul the material out by hand. Oh, the state will not issue the permit. It has to, all the work has to be done by hand. Yes. The contractors, uh, the contracts for, have been posted for solid waste bidding for a three and a half year period. They are online for those who wish to see them. And please remember that there is a parking ban in effect from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m., uh, seven days a week until mid-March 2020 uh, or during snow emergencies and I'll mention now because we mention it every year the parking lot at uh, um, downtown down the down the beach the parking lots are open except for Church Street uh, for major storms for people to park in. Uh, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Questions on the town manager's report. Mrs. Wolseley? Yes. Um, Mr. Welch, I, and this is a little off target, but when the... Is it on the town manager's report? If it isn't, it switch to It relates to the town manager. Okay, that's not on the yeah. town manager's report. You can bring that up under old business or do business. Any other questions about the town manager's report? Regina? No. Jim? I'm set. Rusty? All set on this report, thank you. Thank okay. You. Next, under old business, we have the variable message board purchase. Mr. Welch? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the police department has requested the ability to purchase uh, from the police fund mm -hmm. uh, variable message boards. We had purchased a number of these uh, several years ago, actually eight or nine years ago and they have fallen in complete disrepair. We can't repair them. They don't make the material for the repairs at all. Mm. We do have the funds to purchase it, but we need your permission to take the funds from the, from the special, special account. Huh. I thought we did that last week. Uh, no, we didn't. Oh. <laughs> I wish we did, but it was talked oh. about. We talked about it, didn't we? We yeah. did talk about it, and we just need your approval. Oh, I'll make the motion that I'll we second. allow the chief. How, yeah. much, how much is it? We don't know yet. It's going to be it's going to be sixteen to twenty thousand yeah. dollars. All right, so they'll come so, back to us yes. with the. That, we'll get back to you with. We'll send you copies of the bills and everything else, all the invoices. We're looking to purchase three or four of these if we can. All right. Yeah. So should we make this motion now or wait till we get the? Uh, We'd like the authority to go ahead and start the uh, the purchase yeah. so that we can get that done. We'll report to you back the exact amount of money that was spent. Yeah. Okay. I make the motion that we I allow them to it. do it. All those in favor? Unanimous. Other old business? Uh, well, I don't know if it's old or new. It doesn't matter. The sign you were showing me, Fred, um, today, I think, now, that that's a Winnicott Road sign? You're talking about the sign that was, that was yeah. tipped over? Yeah. That's, that's Route 1 at the Ham New Northampton Town Line. Oh, okay. It is down. Uh, we, Public Works is in the process of dismantling that this week. Uh, we have asked uh, permission from the state to put it back up, and they say we do not have a permit for it. Oh, I can't think. find one. It was put up during the bicentennial. Uh, we, we do know that because I have found a, uh, a plan of the, the, the sign itself and how it was built. Uh, but the state is uh, saying we can't re-erect it at this point. Can we'll, we, be, we'll be dickering with them to get that done. May we, we move to go for the permit? I mean, it can't be that. We're already, we're already starting that process. Oh, okay. Boy, the state is so... Because we had cooperative. three of those at one time. We had three authorized. Two were actually built. Yeah. Three were actually built. We, we had one on Exeter Road. We, we had one on Exeter Road. Okay. When they, when they did the new work on 101... It was taken They'd down. Take it down. All right. It was supposed uh -huh. to been put back up and never was. And I don't. I believe it was probably destroyed because no one knows where it is. Because mm. there were three of those. Yeah. <laughs> and I did find the original plans. I did find th the three signs. No doubt, three signs were were prepared. Yep. Uh, and I, it did say where they were, but I know I've never seen the one on Exeter Road. Yeah. No, it was there, but when they did the yeah. uh, when they did put the new bridge over. Exeter Road. It, it appears when they did that, they, they removed it and, and it was apparently destroyed. Hmm. Any Cause, other old business? Because it is important to have Would you like us to, uh, to re petition for that one too? 
I think it's good to have have them at, at all our entrances. Yes, I don't disagree. I agree. And, uh, and and I think while we're doing it, yes, uh, I believe the town took it down when they would do when when the state notified them they were doing the work. The town took okay. it down. Now it may be stored someplace at Public Works. I don't know. Don't know that. I, I asked I before and I haven't been able to find it there. Hmm. But if 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 while we're getting permits for the other one we should have one on the Exeter road too mm -hmm. might as well so it, 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 there are good welcoming signs to come into yeah. hampton and i think yeah. it's it's important that, that they're there yeah i'll and second rusty if he's making it, a motion we have a consensus it seems oh, okay, okay. It, so. and incidentally when we're talking about the sign that's on the northampton town line uh there's some discussion apparently going on with the state that bridge needs to be replaced up there the railroad bridge Mm -hmm. and there's some discussion as to whether or not it should be discontinued and taken down the area leveled out. <laughs> I would hope if they do that, that they take the material that's, that composes that humongous hill that they built yeah. for the bridge yeah. uh, and put it back where they took the material from, which is up here at the rotary at 10101, uh, <laughs> because that's where it got excavated from, I understand. So. That was long before my time. Yeah, I understand, but I did check into it before, and apparently that's yeah. where it came from. That's that's why there's a huge sunk hole up there. Didn't they just redo that whole bridge? Red, you're an optimist. Uh, they just thinking mean it's the well, they're apparently they're if they're going <laughs> to replace it, they're going to replace it for no reason. They tie up a lot of traffic no more for some maintenance. So right. it would no, make sense to discontinue it altogether. It'd be nice if they were going to do it. They'd put a culvert crossing under there yeah they could very well which means it's a very small a small hill but yeah. still will be allowed yeah. for the rail trail while they're yeah. in that process and right. save them some money we had suggested a railroad culvert which is very small something for a hand car or a small pickup truck or something of that nature correct so Fred you're an optimist any other old business seeing none we move on to new business uh, downtown parking restrictions. Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, uh, I was asked to... Uh, I, I had asked to bring this up. Um, I've had a number of the people in the downtown area. Uh, there's a lot of confusion on what parking is down there and, mm -hmm. and how long it is. We have some areas it's 20 minutes, some areas it's an hour, some areas it's two hours. Uh, yet we have some people that are parking their cars there all day long. Uh, you know, we always try to encourage our local businesses down there. Yeah. And um, I would like to see us make it all one-hour parking. If people want to park longer than an hour, they can park in the municipal lot, which is what we, why we have that. Uh, but I would think that the, uh, uh, if we want to promote downtown, it, we should promote it so that people can, can stop park. freely. Yeah. Stop freely and stop at some of these shops that are mm -hmm. down there. Um, and, and along with that, we need some, uh, uh, hopefully we can get some, maybe a little more presence of the police department down there. I was in Morelli's the other day, and, and, uh, and one of the things that was said was that they don't see the, the, the cops in town any, like they used to see <laughs> back in the old days. And yeah. um, you used to have a cop down, a sign downtown. Hmm. Well, maybe hopefully we could have one of our, if we have a, a uh, town crews that maybe they can actually get out and walk around a little bit and, and, and do that. So mm. um, I would like to see us uh, have it all one hour parking. Right. It on Lafayette Road, High Street. Just okay. Now we can't do anything about uh, um, Depot Square, that's all private. Uh, and the two spaces that are out in front of Depot Square are 20 minutes, which is okay, that's quick in and out for people. Yeah. But the rest of it, the uh, uh, the north, the Lafayette Road, <clears throat> westerly, uh, and easterly, because actually, if if you look at our our uh, code, it still has the three spaces on the side of the hardware store mm -hmm. north, and we don't even have those spaces there anymore. Yeah, they're gone. <laughs> they're gone. So our code says that. So I'd like us to at least look at making it all one hour parking. Could could I ask Rusty a question? Um, with that workforce housing, if that comes into being in that area, uh, 
would you or the planning board or whatever be looking at the parking lot, not a, not the on street parking? I, I heard this is all the on street parking. I heard the workforce housing was going Exeter Road, Exeter Road, yeah. Yeah. across from CRs, but across the, from yeah. CRs in front of uh, there could Cornerstone. be something else coming up. Oh, okay. That's the only that's the only workforce we'll housing down. I've heard that's oh, been. Okay, I, my brain was thinking it was right downtown. Yeah, no, it's not. It's out out on Exeter Road. But I just. You know, we want to encourage people to stop downtown yeah. and, and yeah. get down there. And I'd like people, to say something. Go ahead. I, I agree with what you're saying completely, but what if you're in Greg's and you're in there for more than an hour? I mean, are we going to get people that are going to start calling the cops because someone's been sitting there for an mm -hmm. hour and ten minutes? Or like when I'm at Morelli's, some of those old guys, they go in there and they hang out and they talk to each other. I mean, you know, to make, can we do maybe like two hours? Uh, it, my whole point is, that, you know, it gives people if they if they want to be there and talk for a Can't couple hours, go in, in the town parking lot. It, we've got yeah. to give these people, um, you know, we have some business people that are parking there all day long. Yeah. In front of their place. Well, if you yeah, but an hour just seems like not very long if you're eating dinner or eating lunch or something. I don't know, but. Well, that parking lot also, people were dumping stuff for a number of years. Park their trailer there for the whole winter. Well, or we, we, we've had that cleaned up. I just. Uh, no, so, what has to happen, Mr. Wells, to change these um, restrictions? The board will have to vote on some of the restrictions. You're the only people who can set those restrictions. Okay. Uh, perhaps we should add to a survey. Yeah. Uh, some I, of the residents, ask some I of the residents. I agree owners. 100% with it, but I think we should. Get a recommendation. Get a recommendation from Pete from businesses, yep. right. people. It's going to alienate a lot of residents from, from those people. Yeah. To see what the other one's going to be most affected. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, we so should we uh, ask people to uh, send comments in or come in and speak during public comment? Uh, both. For the next two weeks, and then we'll decide. So two weeks from now is what meeting? Just send an email to Fred, even. Yeah, well, that's fine. Drop in the office, call, we'll make yeah. a list of who calls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But we need some information. How do yeah. you feel about it? Yeah. So I think we'll put on the agenda in two weeks. I think it's a great idea. I think it allows you, 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 your town businesses and, and people that use yeah. that all the time to. Right. So anyone that has a business or anybody that uh, goes to any of these businesses or anyone that wants to comment in general, they have for the next two weeks and in the uh, yeah, the first meeting in December. The first meeting in December, we're going. Second. We, what day is it? I think it's the second. second. Yeah. The of second. December. Could we um, uh, make sure we put that on the website? We will. Yeah. Why don't we make it for the ninth? Okay. That, That's let's fine. make it for the ninth oh, okay. because right. that gives people Give a little bit more week. time yep. to uh, no, I comment. Just, I've had a number of people ask me about it. In a number yeah. of the different shops, and yeah. I well, I think that we need to decide. We already have a 20 minute uh, thing where, there where uh, people, uh, private ownership of Depot Square, we don't want to have too many times because it's a very small area. Exactly. Mm -hmm. right. So, anyone that would like to comment on it, we're going to bring it up here on December 9th at the Board of Selectmen meeting, and uh, we'll make a decision at that time. Good. Um, so next we have the bond reduction for 482 High Street to $2,463.70, 10 percent retained from 24,637. Mr. Walsh. Mr. Chairman is recommended by the Planning Board and Public Works. I'll make the motion. Any I'll does anyone have any comments about it? No. No. As we have a first, a second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Any other new business? Um, you do, I just Yeah. I'd like to ask Fred, we got this good energy memo, um, and I'm wondering, uh, it says New Hampshire adopts electricity aggregation for residents and businesses. I don't know what this would mean to us, but is this something we want to look at? We are looking at it. Uh, the statute allows for and we haven't got all the answers to the questions yet, but it allows for the town to act as an aggregate agency, uh, and all of our residents and businesses could, in fact, I sense for residences only at the moment, but perhaps businesses as well as it comes along, uh, could get into a plan similar to what the town uses, mm -hmm. so that you get your power uh, wielded to you. It, wouldn't, it would come through UNITEL, but it would be maybe from 
Oh, okay. California Gas and Electric, for all I know, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, where, wherever the contractor could get it from at a lower price for a period of time. So huh. we're looking at it. If it's feasible, we'll bring it back to the Board of Selectmen for your review and, and thought process and see whether or not we can't save some people some money. Hmm. It just seems like something that looks like some modern thing that I hadn't thought about, so maybe it might benefit us. Mm. Um, the other quick question I have, um, and maybe this is more appropriate for Christy, but when the, when the rail trail um, expenses uh, start coming in, would we put a separate section in the budget for that, or is there, or would we just add a line somewhere? I'm not sure how we'd, we'd want to segregate those, I would think. Probably a sub-line item for like we have for a lot of other different functions so that we could keep track of what's going on. Okay, and my last real quick question. Um, so we'd be able to see what the expenses are. It would be Every month. outlined in the, yeah. in the budget. Um, when we have individuals who are hired for part-time work, do we ever check on whether the individuals have private or just some kind of personal type of insurance, medical insurance, anything like that? Do we, do we care whether the part-time people, if they get hurt, have something to, to lean on? Actually, it's the type of question you cannot answer Can when yeah, you're hiring an employee. Oh. It's confidential, private information, and we have no legal right to ask it. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I just wonder no, because some people are yeah. doing risky jobs; they're, oh, sure. they're part timers. Yeah. Well, if they're doing risky jobs, they're covered under workers' compensation. Well, they are. Okay, so, so it's not a medical stuff; it's workers' comp. And if anyone gets hurt on the job, they it's have workers' comp. Workers' comp, right? Okay. Well, I just, I like to sort them out and figure what we're doing. Thank any, you. Any other comments? Yes, I do. Um, so last week I was at the NHMA, New Hampshire Municipal Association annual conference, and I was speaking with uh, the executive director, Margaret, who's now Margaret Burns. And I have actually had some communication with her in talking about, you know, how perhaps we could utilize NHMA a little more than we are. And I was hoping to get on to the legislative committee there, which is, well, we know we always see like what they're saying about bills, and this would be, I could serve as a member for Hampton, Good. so that any legislation that comes through that any of us have issues with or, no, or want to see pass, we could actually specifically have a voice. I mean, I don't know if we've done that before in the past, but I think that it might be something that could, uh, benefit Hampton because it seems to me that a lot of times both parties do things that uh, yeah. s sort of yeah. screw it up for here us a lot <laughs> and you know we have Fred that knows a lot about that and I've been discussing things with him and I think that they're a really good use resource for the town to use and the meetings are on a Friday which I could accommodate mm -hmm. so I just wanted to uh, bring that up with the board tonight. I think it's a good idea if Regina is willing to volunteer. Would anyone um, have any comments about this? So do you need to have an invitation from her? She should send a letter instructing it's us a volunteer, how this works. It's a volunteer process. So it's a volunteer thing. No one's actually invited her to do that. No, it's a voluntary basis. People volunteer to do it. I mm -hmm. think that's the basis oh, that's of which they do it. Good. So That's a good idea. And then also the other thing I want to bring up is it was brought to my attention today. McDonald's, you know how they were doing all the construction and they closed? Well, a business owner on Route 1 called me, and I guess they have a big, I mean, I think it's temporary, but it's a big, uh, you know, those, -like. those signs, the A-frame oh. signs. And they um. just, it's, it definitely doesn't, you know, uh, comply with our sign ordinances. And they were just wondering if, and I, I think it just got there because I didn't notice it yesterday. Been there for a while. Oh, it has been. So when it says they're open during construction. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Th yeah. I think we allowed a uh, a those side those type of sideboards at one so time. So long as they're not. We, yeah, we've allowed the them. Uh, yeah, they can't be the blocking past. the sidewalk. Yeah, well, but we have allowed them. I know that we had big discussions about that. But it's probably the there temporarily anyway. So it just says open while 
construction Construction's going mm -hmm. on. Well, well, there's a, to yeah, there's another the sign that says come in, we're open, and check us out. Yeah. Yeah. As long as they move it off the sidewalk, it should be fine. Okay. Because we did have, we had a big thing about the sign. We, we uh, talked about this a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, mm -hmm. one of the things we said is they got to keep four feet of unobstructed sidewalk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, because downtown we have some areas yeah. that have five and six feet of sidewalk in front of mm -hmm. those bu businesses there. Yeah. And so long as they keep four feet of unobstructed, which is what ADA, yeah. I believe, says you have, yeah. is what I'm remembering anyway. Yeah, they gave other, there were other types of signs that we uh, So there's did no disappear. size limitations? No, well, I don't remember exactly about the sign, but there were other types of signs that weren't allowed, and those uh, sign boards, like you're describing, hmm. uh, they use them all over the beach, everywhere else. Yeah. And they were basically looked at as it was okay to yeah, do Yeah, the one at McDonald's is pretty big. It is yeah, kind of and it's like cardboard. Big. It's not... Well, yeah. this <laughs> needs to go to the uh, building inspector. He's the one that's in charge of that. Yeah, well, I just found out like hours ago, so yeah. that's why... Well, I the building check. inspector mm -hmm. is the one that handles signs. So you know what, if anyone has an issue, they should call the building inspector. Yeah. yeah. And the one last thing I have is we received, I don't know if you guys saw, but a petition it looked like from Fellows Ave. Mm -hmm. It was a bunch of people down there. Everybody that received about, it. Okay, is that something that we need to work out, or is that like a planning board? It's actually already worked out. The, unless the planning board reverses their prior position on a prior decision uh -huh. for the condominiums that are down there, uh -huh. the entrance going into the uh, harbor club or the uh, the, um, boat the boat livery, okay is not to be used off of Fellows Avenue except for fire, police, or ambulance. Yeah. They now want to make that a major entranceway oh. for everybody going into the condominiums plus the harbor. Uh -oh. And that was, that was that, I believe that went to court, didn't it? That's, no, no, that one didn't go to court, but that is enforced. And in fact, they've given the entranceway to the town. It's now town property, so they can't use it. Well, I hope not. Mm. Yeah. So we're, we're preparing next year to, in fact, finish that work down there to put uh, fellows and uh, uh, the next road that, are, that it goes into into the proper position as, as it was laid out back when the entire area was founded. Yeah. It's supposed to go down to a corner yeah. and it goes across private property now. Oh, So we're going to need to return that property to those owners. Mm. So mm -hmm. the police department will be aware when you have all the ducks in a row? And well, it's blocked off. Oh, yeah, you okay. can't get through there. You can't I haven't found that for a while. Skated. No, it, and it requires is, a permanent gate that only the fire, police, and ambulance have a key to. Good, good. This has been talked about over and over and over again. Yeah. And it was finally settled. They have uh, achieved a permanent grandfather status for that condominium project, mm. but this is one of those requirements. They would now like to change it all. Mm. So. And that happens at the planning board. Uh, in this case, it can't happen at the planning board because the property's been turned over to the town. Yeah. So it's got to happen here. Good. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any other comments? No. Nope. Make a motion to adjourn at 2047. Second. I'll second. All those in favor? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Channel 22. Ross here. <laughs>